Today, we'll be following the journey of two giant bull ants, a Mimesia nigrosincta and the famous Mimesia golosa. We'll follow these two queens through the largest challenges of their life, raising their first generation of workers. We will watch these queens as they perform the hardest test of their life. They must hunt, care for their brood, meticulously grooming them and endlessly feeding them, and most importantly, they must teach their first workers how to survive. But it all had to start at day one. First, we had to acquire the royals, and to do this, we had to go directly to the source a nuptial flight. After a while of searching and a bit of luck, we had captured a Mimesia nigrosincta queen. We released her into her new outworld and she quickly began exploring. Already, she is tasked with her first two challenges. She must find food and build a founding chamber. It didn't take long for her to find the honey that we had provided, but she hasn't found her nesting space yet. It is insanely important that she does find it soon, as it will serve as her safe place to raise her first workers. To get the second queen wasn't going to be as easy, but luckily we knew someone that could help. Here she is, the mighty Mimesia golosa. She is two and a half centimeters in length and is extremely deadly and aggressive. One test tube change later and here we are. She is still quite confused at where she is. You can see her grooming herself. She does this to sharpen her senses so she can smell her surroundings more acutely. This queen was quite weak from the great journey over here, so she was very quick to find the honey we provided. By day 4, both the queens had now moved into their test tubes and had laid their first batches of eggs. These first eggs are insanely important for the development of the colony, as they will become the queen's first workers. Over the next couple of days, there were no changes in the colony's development. Until the day 24. Some of the Negrosincta's eggs had started to go clear. This means that they are about to hatch into larvae. Meanwhile, the Golosa's eggs on the other hand, weren't ready to hatch just yet. But she had a sizable pile of brood. Then, by day 30, it finally happened. The Negrosincta's eggs hatched into tiny larvae. It was time for the queen's first challenge, to feed them. We got a cricket leg and placed it in her test tube entrance. She cautiously approached it, using her long antennae to smell what it was. Although, her curiosity was short-lived, and she didn't take the food just yet. Perhaps her larvae are still too small and don't require food just yet. The Golosa, on the other hand, hadn't been going quite as well. Her large clutch of eggs had been scattered all around her tube. This could be a sign of infertility, but that is unlikely. For now, we'll just have to wait and see. Luckily, the other queen had continued to go well, as a few days later, we checked on the Negrosincta, and the larvae had grown substantially. We knew that it was time for their first meal. Using our tweezers, we placed a freshly killed termite in the tube, which the queen immediately rushed towards. Although, 
her sensational vision was proving to be a handicap, and she started chasing the tweezers. Although soon, she locked on the termite. Then BAM! She struck the termite with her powerful mandibles, and dragged it back to her hungry larvae. By day 50, the larvae had tripled in size since they'd first hatched, and we knew that soon they would be spinning their cocoons. There was more bad news for the Golosa Queen. She had eaten even more of her eggs. It was looking more and more like she was infertile, but we had one more trick that would hopefully get her to raise the small number of eggs she had left. In 1963, we fed the Negrosincta a small cricket. This was the largest insect she had had to face up against so far. Although, she made short work of it, injecting her potent stinger into it, paralyzing it. But looking over at her brood pile, something was wrong. One of the larvae was ready to spin a cocoon, but it looked like it had already failed to do so. It lay stretched out. We knew we would have to intervene to ensure that the other brood would make it. The Golosa had once again laid a fresh batch of eggs. We hoped this time that they wouldn't be eaten. On day 73, disaster struck. All but one of the Negrosincta's larvae had failed to spin their cocoons. We are not really sure why this happened, although it may have had something to do with the substrate not being coarse enough. We had to ensure that the final larvae made it, or she would have to start all over again. But thankfully, only a few days later, the larvae had managed to spin its cocoon, and the queen had even laid a small batch of eggs. All that was left to do was to wait for her cocoon to hatch. On day 80, our suspicions were confirmed. The Golosa queen lay lifeless in her outworld. We aren't 100% sure what caused her sudden death, although it was likely due to infertility. Finally, we had reached day 100. I held my breath as I looked into the Negrosincta Queen's nest. Next to her stood a tiny nanitic worker, still stumbling on its feet. She had done it, passing her life's greatest tests. Her relentless hunting, cleaning and feeding had all paid off. In the natural world, not every queen will reach the pinnacle of her journey. The weaker individuals often perish, making way for the stronger and more resilient to thrive. This process, while seemingly harsh, is a reminder of how nature operates. Each loss creates an opportunity for another to succeed, ensuring the continued strength and adaptability of the species.